Hi, and welcome back to this great academy lecture on biology. And today we're going to be looking at the cell and energy carriers with a view to getting you started on to respiration and photosynthesis. We've got to explore the energy carriers before we can actually get into any of those biochemical um, reactions. So let's have a quick look at how the cell operates in terms of this energy carriers. So the first slide that we've got is our back to our ultra structure of the cell. And we're focusing at the moment on the, on the cytoplasm, which most people will think is just something that's holding a jelly-like substance that's holding everything else together. And yeah, absolutely, that is one of its functions, but it's actually a lot more than that. And if we look at the next slide, we can see uh, there are a couple of functions here. So one, two, five, we've got actually, yeah, okay. Some of them are exactly what you think. Jelly-like substance holding all the cell organelles in, in place. It also holds a lot of the raw materials that you'll need and that you've been learning all the way throughout the course, like enzymes, raw materials for protein synthesis, uh, nucleotides, bases, all of those kind of things. And lots of people get bogged down in where do those things come from? Well, they're actually waiting in the cytoplasm for these uh, reactions to be to begin. But at the very bottom, you'll see there's two words that are quite important for you to understand before we go any further into respiration. Um, the protoplasm and the cytosol. Now, the protoplasm is the living part of the cell with the nucleus. It includes the nucleus. So that's the word that describes literally everything in the cell. But the cytosol is something a little bit more special. It's the cytoplasm without any of the organelles. Now, that's kind of hard to visualize sometimes. So I've got a little picture on the next slide that helps us to understand what that might look like. This one, the first one, is the protoplasm, nucleus, and the cytoplasm. So you can see everything's there. The second one is the cytosol and the organelles without the nucleus. Okay, and the very last one, this is the most important one. I'm going to move myself out of the way for the moment. The very last one, cytosol is the cytoplasm without any organelles. So we're missing the significant chloroplast, we're missing the nucleus, we're missing the mitochondria, the really important ones um, they're missing, and the ribosomes have been dotted out there. Okay, so the cytosol is a really important word for you to know when we're talking about respiration, um, because that's where, of course, um, glycolysis begins. But before we get to that, we've got to look at our energy carriers. So there's a few energy carriers that need to be considered. We're going to take them one at a time. And if you look at them, you can see you wouldn't be pushed to think that these two are related to each other. And these two, NAD positive and NADH, and then NADP positive and NADPH, they are related to each other as well. So we're going to have a quick exploration of those. Right. The first one we're going to start off with is ADP, adenosine diphosphate. It would be described as a low energy molecule. Um, and it's hanging out in the cytoplasm, waiting to be triggered to get involved in a reaction. Now, what this thing is really important for is because it actually can gain some energy and bond to a third phosphate. Now, I've drawn this um, a little bit like a tennis ball, tennis um container, tennis ball container, and this is the one I use in school, so it's a little bit bashed around, but maybe it'll get the point across. So it's got ADP written on the side, adenosine diphosphate. So there's two phosphates inside here, and there are two tennis balls. Now, um, like I said, each one of these is a, a phosphate, all right, depicting a phosphate. Now, this is really useful because when energy comes along, it can actually be added onto it. So the form the energy would take is as a um, an a high energy bond. It's described as a high energy bond. And if you can see that, that's a spring. And usually what I do with my students in school is actually put the spring in on top of those two phosphates. Now this is a bond. It's a high energy bond. So it's actually vibrating very, very strongly. And it gets pushed in um, on top of the phosphates and another phosphate that happens to be in the cell cytoplasm, see where it's a little bit underrated, um, gets added on to that that current ADP. Now the ADP got stuck there. So the ADP has now turned into something which is much more useful. The ADP has now turned into ATP, adenosine triphosphate. Now, what we said a second ago is that that's ADP has now turned into ATP because there are three phosphates in there. You can see it's actually you can see it's about to bump and to burst out. And that's perfect because now we can say exactly what this is useful for. 
inside between the second and the third phosphate, there is a high energy bond. That means there's energy stored in here. So ATP, the first thing you can say about it, it is an energy store. When it's required by a part of the cell, it is carried. The ATP is actually moving across the cell to wherever it's needed. Therefore, the energy is being carried inside this ATP. Therefore, you can call it an energy carrier. And once it gets to where it's going, it actually breaks down. And maybe you saw that, maybe you didn't. It was fairly spectacular. Um, when it breaks down, what happens is the energy springs out. So the energy spring is gone. And what I've got left in here is my two ATPs and the phosphate, the third phosphate has gone too. So it reverts back to what it was in the first place, ADP. Okay, so my ADP is reformed. The energy is used in the reaction. That's why it was there in the first place. It was brought to that particular part of the cell so that it could be used. And now this thing is going to go find some more energy and another phosphate and keep repeating the process over and over again. So there are three things that you can say about adenosine triphosphate once you've made it from this. So adenosine diphosphate is a low energy molecule. But once that low energy molecule has added some energy, high energy bond. And I'm going to show you that little spring. So there you go. You've got your ADP at the very start and the energy in the form of a little spring here, just to show it visually and a phosphate. There's the third tennis ball. So it's always between the second and the third phosphate. And what you end up with is what's known as ATP, adenosine triphosphate. Now this is the one that has a huge amount of energy stored in here. And because it's actually stored in there, if the ATP itself goes anywhere, it's called an energy carrier. And then wherever, it, whenever it gets to where it's going, it releases the energy and therefore it's called an energy provider. This process of adding a phosphate on to an ADP is called phosphorylation. It's an important one just to have in your head as we go into um, respiration as well. Okay, so. This is my adenosine, that's how it forms my ATP. Three things you need to say about it. It's a high energy carrier, it's an energy store, and it's an energy provider. So sometimes at the end of um, um, a question 14 in the leaving cert, they might say, write a note on ADP. There isn't much to say about ADP, ADP, except the fact that it's a low energy molecule, but you can certainly say that it becomes ATP, and now you've got lots to say about it. Okay, so ADP, ATP are covered. What have we got to talk about next? Right, there's just showing your, um, the energy being produced and my phosphate jumping out again. Okay, so now we've got to talk about the next one, which is NAD positive and NADP positive. Now I've put these two together. And the reason I've put these two together is because they work exactly the same as each other. The only difference is that P, and that P is a phosphate. And what you need to remember is that once you have NADP, it can only be in a plant. NAD can be in both animals and plants, but NADP can only work in plants. So what does it stand for? Now, this was a difficult one because a few years ago, um, it was kind of understood, it was a recognized um, code, I suppose, that NAD didn't have to be understood. To the the um, um, You didn't have to be able to say exactly what the words meant, like we do with ADP and ATP. But now we definitely do. They asked it a couple of years ago. Um, so it's important to know that NAD stands for nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. And if it's got a P at the end of it, it's a phosphate. And if it's got a H, it's a hydrogen. So nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. Okay. And now what does this one do? Well, now this one is a slightly different uh, methodology for actually uh, producing energy. This one does something a little bit different. The NAD positive, that's what we start off with. And you imagine it like a little box um, and it picks up. Its job is to pick up two electrons, two high energy electrons, there they are. And they've got like a little star shape around them which kind of gives them the effect that they're high energy and a H plus. 
Now the H plus is going to come into it in a second. So when I add on those two, uh, two electrons, what happens is that one of those negatives cancels out that positive. And then you've still got another negative, so it adds on and the whole thing becomes negative. Now, this is just helping you understand uh, how it forms the NADH at the end. Here's my H plus. Now, this thing people get confused with. It's a H plus. It's also called a hydrogen ion. It's also called a proton. They're exactly the same thing. So don't be confused by that. They're all the same thing. And when that NAD minus adds on to a H plus, you just get NADH formed. OK, so why am I showing it with pictures down here? So it looks like a box. You put in your two electrons and it now becomes NAD minus. And once you've got a H plus, you put the lid on, it acts as a lid, and now you've got NADH. OK, the electrons and protons, H plus uh, hydrogen ions, are released where needed in the cell. And NAD positive is present in both plants and animals, like I said at the start. OK, now, what's the point? These two little electrons are high energy, therefore they can be used by other things. But they have no means of transport. So the way we look at NAD positive is it's a transport medium. It picks up those two high energy electrons. It picks up that H plus and it brings it to somewhere else. Now, once it gets there, if it's going to provide those two electrons, they, the NADH has to break down. So the next slide is going to show that. OK, so I'll give myself. What happens to the NAD positive from the breakdown of NADH? So here we are. The NADH now has been required in part of the cell. And it has arrived, like the box, with the two electrons in the middle and the H plus on the top. And it breaks down. And when it breaks down, it releases into what made it up in the first place. NAD positive, there it is, two electrons, there they are. And then the very last thing is our H plus. So now they're all separated. This guy, the NAD positive, goes back and literally starts to do the whole process all over again. It's like a shuttle bus. So it brings people back and forth from one place to another. But it goes back to pick up more people brings them to where they want to go, goes back to bring up more people, brings them more to the one where they want to go. It's exactly like that. The only thing that this NAD positive is picking up are two high energy electrons and a H plus. And sometimes in the exams, they use word like, words like species. What species are, are, are um, used or provided by NADH? And that word just kind of is there to maybe describe them in a different way. It can be very off-putting, but there is nothing else that this thing will actually pick up and collect. Only two high energy electrons and a H plus. So you, you have nothing else to write down. You don't leave blanks in exams. Write those two things down. Okay. The bottom here, the NAD positive formed. Sometimes they ask you what's the fate of the NAD positive. And the fate of the NAD positive is to re return to pick up more electrons and H pluses and repeat the process over and over again. OK, finally, this substance, NADP positive, it's another energy carrier, like we mentioned at the very start. It works exactly the same way as the NAD positive, but it's only found in plants, like I said there a minute ago. So I'm going to show you really quickly how this one works. And that is us finished on energy carriers. So NADP positive. So now the difference is the phosphate. That's all. NADP plus takes on its two high energy electrons and a H plus. And it ends up becoming NADPH altogether. It's done in stages for you here. So the NADP positive plus two high energy electrons plus a H plus will make NADPH. OK. Right. So hopefully that was useful. Um, like I said, this is building up to, to bring us into respiration so that it can be a little bit um, easier to understand as we go through it. Um, so thanks so much for watching this great Academy lecture. And until next time, happy learning.